the series began in 1952, and this will be the, uh, I think, if my count is not in error, the 15th lecture in the series. Ladies and gentlemen, our 1967 Candle Lecturer is no newcomer to this campus. We just established that in 1956, he came for the first time. I was not at Emory at the time, but I had the reports uh, from both sides. And the meeting seems to have been a very happy one. Since then, his work has been studied and seriously studied at this university. And uh, we are sort of happy uh, that the first doctoral seminar on Eric Fugelin's philosophy of history, the subject of these lectures, was instituted last year at Emory as part of the regular curriculum. When he came in 56, he was Boyd Professor of Government at the Louisiana State University, and he has moved very far away from what we call government. His field has widened, and it has widened from the core of the problem of political societies and of order and disorder in the body politic to where it became what the title of this series now calls the drama of man. It has widened out into history. It has deepened into an analysis of man's position in this great play of which he does not know the purpose and where he does not know his role, but where he knows that he is by participating in it. A great poet also dealt with this play almost a century and a half ago, Goethe, and in the prologue to his Faust, he has the stage manager discuss with the playwright how to present a spectacle that will catch the audience, will move it, will excite it, and above all, bring it to the box office. And they finally decide, and I'm going to give it to you in the original German, that the thing to do is to take them und führt sie mit bedächtiger Schnelle vom Himmel durch die Welt zur Hölle. I translate it, it's topical, to take them with deliberate speed, a term that has recurred recently, <laughs> from heaven through the world to hell. In a sense, I assume that this is going to be the direction which our candle lectures will take because it's going to wind up with us. <laughs> I take very great pleasure in presenting today the philosopher Eric Fugelin, who will speak about the paradise part, man in the cosmos. Mr. Chairman, I should rather say the both Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your kind introduction and especially for, for the server, for the organization, uh, because uh, he has advised me that I must not simply barge into the subject, because that is bad manners. One has to give an introduction linking the subject matter to the more accustomed and conventional beliefs and assumptions. So one must not simply present a new idea or unknown materials or something like that, but bring it in proper order. Now I shall uh, abide by this advice and behave uh, pedagogically, which makes me a behaviorist, I think. <laughs> and um, I have, however, then, if I uh, start relating the subject I have to deal with, to the present situation, to bring a few things which properly would belong into the third of these lectures. And it will take up some time, and therefore then the whole lectures will have a slight redshift from 
the first to the second, from the second to the third. I cannot finish all the materials concerning the cosmic problems in the first and not all the uh, consciousness problems in the second, but I have them to shorten the third because I have to bring that in here in order to start properly. Now, with this introduction, ladies and gentlemen, I now may, may come to the subject matter itself, which is linking what I have to say about the drama of humanity to the contemporary situation. Now, the first thing that is perhaps unusual, if it is used as a technical term, is to speak of a drama of humanity and not of a drama of man. We will presently see why there's an important difference. But it gives us a starting point, I have to be clear about it, or we have to be clear about it, uh, what is the present conception of man in a public sense. We must always distinguish between the dealings which a few specialist scholars or philosophers have with such problems and what is generally accepted and generally known. And I want to give therefore first, uh, simply enumerating, the terms in which popularly modern man is characterized in general in a general topical fashion and then in opposition formulate how the same features have to be characterized from a critical position. You will then see best by this mere enumeration of categories that there is a wide gap between the accepted conception, publicly accepted, and what is done today in philosophy. Now, when we speak of modern man and use the self-characterization of him in the society in which we all live as modern man, you will find such terms as, first of course, the term modern man, then frequently used Peculiarly modern is to be a secular man. Then very much into fashion has come, especially beginning with Toynbee, the idea that modern man is living in a post-Christian age and therefore a post-Christian man. And if the matter gets some sort of philosophical polish, you will then call that post-Christian man an immanentist or well, immanent man. So these are the most usual terms in which we speak about man if we want to, we want to characterize him as a modern man. And of course modern man is living in an age. Everything that's elegant lives in an age. And so we also have to live in an age, it's modern or something like that. And we'll see then uh, what it is. Now these are the terms of self-characterization. If we now use critical um, empirical and philosophical vocabulary to characterize the same situation, we would have to say that the modern man who is intended by these more or less cliché terms is in the first place a fundamentalist, in the second place he is illiterate, in the third place he is burning with apocalyptic fire and therefore torn between being frightened by the world and full of expectation that something will become better. So this ambivalence of attitude of being frightened and expectant at the same time, that is what usually is called then, again by a general term, alienation, an alienated man. So these three characteristics, now I have to explain a bit in detail, the fundamentalist, the illiterate and the apocalyptic characteristic. Just let me say in sum, uh, free, uh, frequently there has been used also in order to characterize this peculiar compound, a term used by a German theologian who became a victim of Hitler by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He calls this combination, man has come of age. These three items. Now let me elaborate that. I said the first characteristic is the dogmatism, the fundamentalism. But fundamentalism is man. A peculiarity of our modern civilization, which already starts in the 16th century. The great war periods of the West since the 16th century are intellectual war periods in the sense of wars among dogmas. Let's call them briefly dogmatomachies, fights among dogmas. 
In the 18th century, 16th century, there were the religious fights between various types of dogmatic theologies. In the 20th century, there have become the great fights between various dogmatic ideologies. So we have a series of dogmas crystallizing since the 16th century, uh, roughly three, the three which have entered into the Kantian philosophy of history, we begin with a theological dogma that is then followed by a metaphysical dogma and the metaphysical dogma then by an ideological dogma. So there's a series of three dogmas. As soon as we get out of one, we fall into the next and at present we are still living in the ideological dogma as far as there are not preserved theological dogmas or uh, the metaphysical dogma. Now when I speak of dogma, I do not mean what is usually called an orthodoxy, but the specific kind of literalism or fundamentalism in which of a religious attitude or of an attitude concerned with the relation between man and divinity. There is nothing left but the literalist formulation that is the dogma and there is no original experience of the experiences which have produced symbolism but only the dogma itself is left. So when that situation has arrived, that only the dogma itself is left, be it theological or metaphysical or ideological, then we are in the fundamentalist situation. Now this fundamentalist situation, that's why I mentioned the whole thing, you must realize, lasts now for well over 400 years. And if anywhere we are at present, you might say at the end of this, doctrinaire, fundamentalist attitude, and recapturing experiences from various sources. But that is meant what is meant by, uh, what I mean by fundamentalism. So fundamentalism is one of the characteristics of modern man. Now parallel with this, permanently aggravating uh, fundamentalism of dogma, we have the attempt again since the 16th century, of recapturing experiences, original experiences, which will us get again back of the dogma into the reality of relations between man and his surrounding reality, including divine reality. Such attempts have been undertaken, for instance, in the 17th century by Descartes, and very energetically by Hegel in his Phenomenology of 1807. The introduction of Hegel's phenomenology is an essay on the question that after the dogmatism of enlightenment, we have to have recourse to experience in order to reconstitute the understanding of man's relation to his surrounding reality, including the divine reality. One cannot simply go on with mere dogma, which as to its origins is not understood. In the 20th century, parallel with the ideological wars, we have also such typical um, philosophers who try to recapture experience. At the beginning of the century stands an American philosopher, I should say, uh, William James's uh, Does Consciousness Exist? That essay of 1804 has perhaps an importance for the 20th century comparable to the meditations of Descartes in the 60s. It is happening to it. And similar attempts to recapture experiences were made by Bergson, especially in his De Source de la Morale et de la Religion, and in the metaphysical works of Whitehead, beginning with 1924. I could mention others, for instance, I like very much the English physicist Eddington, who has uh, given a very fine analysis of the problem experience, of experiences posed by the advance of the natural science. Now, this double game of an ever deeper sinking into dogmatism and fundamentalism, and more or less desperate attempts to recapture reality, the reality of experience, that goes on, as I said, for the 400 years and it has a very peculiar consequence. <coughs> and here I come now to the second characteristic, what I call the illiteracy. 
we have a very high degree of literacy on the level of dogma. At no other time did we have such a perfect knowledge of all sorts of religions, of comparative religion, of religions of uh, ancient civilizations, of uh, religions of contemporary Asiatic civilizations, and so on, but not a very good analysis of the experiences on which they rest. So, the characteristic of illiteracy pertains to the understanding of experiences and the symbols in which they have to be expressed. For instance, there is extremely little active culture of meditation in the Christian or philosophical sense or any other sense, and of the symbolisms which rest on meditation. I have to talk about them in the second lecture then. So in that sense we have a peculiar illiteracy with regard to the most essential problems of human reality, coupled with an enormous literacy with regard to peripheral problems. That is one of the peculiarities. And that has particularly disastrous effect on the Western conditions, which uh, lead then to the third character characteristic, to the apocalyptic characteristic, and that is that our whole Western civilization has distinguished, say, from a Greek civilization or from an Egyptian civilization, is a civilization which has grown through acculturation. That is to say, it does not grow on the original basis of the older cosmic civilizations and the cosmological myths, drawing for its substance on that older place, but it starts in on a comparatively primitive level of the Germanic tribes, taking over a highly developed civilization, the Mediterranean civilization of approximately the 4th, 5th, 6th century, and this process of acculturation is now exposed to great dangers because if these cultural contents which have been acquired but have not originally grown in Western civilization get lost, there is nothing on what one can fall back as distinguished from a Greek civilization or an Egyptian civilization. There is no archaism, for instance, possible in Western civilization, because Western civilization has no archaic period. Such a thing as, for instance, the late um, Egyptian period in which one can fall back on uh, the sculpture and uh, uh, art forms of the third millennium BC is impossible because there is no third millennium BC in Western civilization, and you cannot fall back on the Vikings. That is, uh, they are just too far distant from any developed civilization. So there is no internal coherence in Western civilization from the early beginning to the present, but when you have an acculturation process of this kind, the deculturation process, which the result of this order, is considerably more dangerous than periods of this order in other civilizations which do have their connection with an original mythical order. We have nothing we can fall back on. Therefore, phenomena of alienation, which as you will see, we find amply, for instance, around 2000 BC in the Egyptian Great Crisis, have a particular acuteness in Western civilization in our time, a sort of radical alienation, because there is nothing on which one can fall back. If certain culture contents are destroyed, they are simply one has to go about it to recapture them somehow. That's one of the problems of the 20th century. That is the reason why so many people today, since we don't have a myth of our own in our civilization, will now go back to archaeology, into comparative religion, into comparative literature, and similar subject matters, because that is the place where they can recapture the substance which in our acculturated and now deculturing civilization is getting lost. That is why people become all of a sudden Zen Buddhists. It's funny, you see, but uh, you have to become a Zen Buddhist because there is nothing comparable in Western civilization to which you can fall back if a dogmatism has run out as the Christian has in the, in the Age of Enlightenment. So in this sense, therefore, we have, beginning with the 19th <coughs> century, a peculiar development of historical construction in which all previous history is thrown out 
and the sort of original beginning is made always in the present, with the present state of consciousness, be that in the Hegelian system or the Kantian system or the Maxian system, any one of the great ideological systems of the 19th century, a sort of apocalyptic construction by which all past history is thrown out as more or less irrelevant or having its relevance only as leading up to the present point, and from this present point that is now the modern point in which we have to live. Really on a point, throwing out all past history. That is the characteristic perhaps of the modern apocalyptic mood. One should, however, introduce a slight differentiation about which I have to talk more in the last lecture, that the great apocalyptic thinkers of the 19th century, I just mentioned them, men like Hegel or like Kant or like Marx, still based their apocalyptic view of history on a very thorough knowledge of historical materials. So they were themselves very good historians. While today, Usually, their apocalyptic position at which they resulted is taken over, but there is not taken over with it all the historical knowledge that went into its formation. And therefore, you have a peculiar epigonal apocalypse in the 20th century, which results then in, for instance, an attitude of what today in Russia is called Soviet communism a special sort of communism which is not identical with Marxism. Genuine Marxists oppose this kind of communism and there is an internal revolt going on from the Marxists against the communists who are the epigonal type from whom the uh, bureaucrats are recruited. While the intellectuals would go back to Hegel and Marx because they are still are the origins, the existential origins of this apocalypse to be found. So in that manner you have a peculiar epigonal dogmatism which does not even retain the older historical knowledge that still was present, say, in 1830, 1840, and 1850. That is also gone. So in this way you have, therefore, a peculiar deculturation process resulting in relegating to a realm of uh, practical ignorance, such areas of reality as are symbolized by myth, by philosophy, by revelation symbols, and by mysticism. These are the four major symbolizations of original experiences, and they, together with the original experiences, are mostly removed from the present intellectual discourse. When I say that I think of quite concrete things, say for instance in the Anglo-American area of philosophy, the dominant philosophical movement is still, you might say, British analysis, and without it being in any way critical of British analysis, if you confine your knowledge to British analysis, you have eliminated all the areas of reality symbolized by myths, philosophy, revelation, and mystery. So practically everything that's important in life is removed <laughs> if you <laughs> confine yourself to the type of logical analysis quite solid in itself. I'm a great adherent in that respect of British analysis, but confined to a type of logic which takes its model from the act of sense perception. And all these other areas are not areas of sense perception, but something entirely different. Now, in this development, which I've done, just now characterized, you have certain outstanding uh, milestones. You can, for instance, see the progress of this deculturation process in the change of the meaning of the term immanence from the, 18, from the 19th century to the 20th century. When you look at the authors in the first half of the 19th century, at men like De Quincey or Browning or Matthew Arnold, who already worried about that problem of a god disappearing from this world. The word immanence is always used in the sense of that god somehow disappears and ceases to be immanent. That he is transcendent anyway, and in addition should be immanent. That is taken for granted. 
but somehow he ceases to be immanent. In that connection, the term immanence appears. While today, if you read contemporary literature, you will always find that immanence is not characterized as an absence of God, but as a presence of man. That is, man is the subject of whom immanence is predicated. Man is very much immanent. That is the meaning which the term is used now, while Browning or De Quincey or Matthew Arnold still would say that God is, or should be immanent, and is unfortunately not immanent. So in this shift in the meaning of the term immanence in common usage and literature, you can about see how the actions have shifted from still a um, measure of consciousness where the problem lies, that some piece of reality is getting lost because it is no longer immanent, to, you might say, an unknowing acceptance of the loss and the statement that man is the subject of immanence. We have an immanence is man now. Uh, not a lack of an immanent is God. So, from this position, which I just outlined, we have to distinguish between immanentist constructions of history. Man is constructed as a function of history in such philosophies of history as those of Kant, Hegel, and Marx, with an apocalyptic presence, that is, a presence in which all past reality is relegated to a dead past, and all presence is concentrated in this empirical presence in time, loaded with expectation that something meaningful will come out of this presence. That is the characteristic of an apocalyptic attitude, projecting into the future and forgetting about the past, the dead past and the living future. With regard to such an opposition of a dead past with a living future, one should, for instance, be aware that these ideas of a time that flows from a past into a future on a symbolized line, just one line running to the point of present, is a conception, the meaning of the word future, which does not become current before the middle of the 18th century. Up to the middle of the 18th century, we have no term for what today always we call the future, a better future, a more peaceful future, or God knows what. This term, meaning of future, did not exist in any European language before <coughs> 1750. But an entirely different one, to which I shall return presently. As against such immanentist constructions of history, now I shall develop here in these lectures a different concept of history, History is an open field of existence. <coughs> now the difference between the construction just characterized and what I shall present here can be formulated diagrammatically in the following manner. If you have this late 18th century concept of time, you would have to have something like a line. A line of time going in this direction. Now, if you have the problem of an open time, you would have always to consider that at every point of presence on this line, we are not moving only on this line, but in openness toward divine reality. Let's say two many So that every point of presence is, as uh, here's Elliot's formulation, Elliot's formulation, a point of intersection of time with the time. That is a point of presence. So that the whole series of time then would not be a series on a line at all, but a series of present points in which none is ever past, but only past in relation to my present, but not really. Ontologically, really, it is always in relation to the present, which is the same present, which is my present, constitutes my present here and now. On this conception of a divine present, which is the present in every present point on the land, depends every construction of history that makes sense, every sense of history at all. There would be no reason whatsoever where we should know, worry about anything 
that happened 3,000 years ago or three minutes ago, unless there were a reason perhaps to remember it, because it is connected with our present point three minutes later, because it has a presence, just as our point has a presence. So a proper diagrammatical formulation would then not be the line, but you would have to make it something like a flow of presence, as I call it, with a direction in which there is permanently a tension between the immanent and the transcendent pole. That would be a proper diagram of time, but not a straight line. Perhaps I should say a few words more about that, because, as I said, this line point, this line diagram of time, arose in the 18th century. And already Kant had his trouble with that conception of a straight line time, because he had to ask himself, if we have such a straight line of time going in one direction and approaching a point of perfection somewhere in an indefinite future. And in the indefinite future you would have that on the one hand indefinite and on the other hand large capital perfection. <laughs> that was his conception of history, approaching in an indefinite approach the realm of perfection. And then he would ask himself, how large is our perfection in any finite time in which we live? Because we don't know live after all infinitely, but only for a span of time. And now take any finite piece of time, make it small t, which may represent 10 years or 50 years or a century or a human lifetime, and then ask yourself the question, how large is progress within that finite time? And then you would have to formulate that this finite time is equal to the large perfection uh, times, no, let's get it this that small perfection to the complete perfection uh, is related like t to infinite, which gives you then the equation p is capital T times t by infinite, <coughs> which is equal to what? Zero. <laughs> 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 the line of time with indefinite perfection, you see, all finite progress in time is zero. So there is an inherent logical problem. <laughs> so I'm operating with the conception of a flow of presence. By the way, the, in order to, uh, we have to, uh, the third lecture where we have to be more with this thing, so I may go on with the question of time just for one step more. Uh, Maurice Merleau Ponty has in his uh, uh, Phenomenology de la Perception given a further very amusing analysis of the problem of time because he said, time is nothing at all but a relation between myself and what I imagine to be time. And therefore, if I have such a line here now, I cannot talk about it in the abstract, but I have to place myself in relation to it. And if I imagine it to be a flow, and myself standing as a person here, on the border of that river of time, then it flows past me in this direction. A flow presumably somehow we are ending in some sort of ocean. <laughs> and therefore, all past time lies here in the future, and all future time comes back here from where you imagine the past to be. That's a lovely problem. <laughs> <laughs> Which has considerable importance in the reality, because this past time is what you try to recapture that past time, and for instance, um, De Quincey 
has the symbolization to this Savannah del Mar, that all kinds of things concern is the past, which lies here as an underground or under city, and which has to be recaptured somehow, a nightmare. It is the past. And you have a similar problem, not in the nightmare, of course, but still, you have a problem like that in Proust's Recherche du Temps Perdu, the time that got lost. And that is the time in which you are occupied by it. If you operate with such a conception of a life. Of course, if you can take another uh, situation, you can assume that you are, that this is a flow and you are in it. Then the flow would go past you. You would be a constant at some point. And then indeed, you uh, would be in the stream flowing with it into the future. Which is another very interesting consequence, but we cannot go into the audit here now. But you see, I just want to loosen up a bit your idea about time. It is not an easy matter, but you can use all sorts of symbolisms. You should be aware that you use symbolisms, why you use a symbolism, and the question which is the proper symbolism to be used can only be solved by analysis of reality and not just by talking about that. One has to analyze reality. So I am using here the flow of present conception to which I shall have to come back then presently in detail. So that is the general position of history uh, which I shall use here. Now, the title of these lectures is The Drama of Humanity. It is not about man but about our humanity. Now why? We are accustomed, for instance, to talk about the nature of man. And then you have usually the great fights between adherents of a classic philosophy who will tell you that the nature of man is a constant. And between the apocalyptically excited intellectuals who tell you the nature of man changes and will change even more in the future, and we, all our expectations for the future and for a new realm on this earth depend on changes in the nature of man. Now obviously you are here again in a logical problem because if by nature of anything you mean the constant features, the constant features can't change because then they wouldn't be constant. Uh, so there is a logically impossible. By definition, the nature can't change. But there is a real problem, nevertheless. And that real problem is present already at the time when the conception of a nature of man is formed in antiquity, in classical philosophy. That's where it's formed. And there arises the conception that man has a nature in the sense of a form like any object of sense perception. Like a table that is developed according to a plan, or like a plant which has obviously an uh, organismic plan in its growth and so on. And that is a decisive point. You see, we are very close still in our uh, English empiricism since the 18th century to the Aristotelian conception that a metaphysics of man has to be formulated in terms of form and matter. So, either the artifact or the organism is the model on which you philosophize. But it isn't really man. So if you transfer the model of a form and the matter uh, organized by that form to the human person or to a society, you run into difficulties simply because society is neither an artifact nor an organism, but something entirely different. It is engaged in some sort of a process which is not the same as that of the model of artifact or organism. And you run therefore into the problem that there is a process of change in conflict with the assumed form. And one can only solve that problem by admitting that here is a difficulty and the answer is, there is obviously enough of stable features in man to recognize him as a human being, and obviously enough of process in him in order to recognize that there is a process going on in him, and not only as an animal on the organic level, but also on the mental, intellectual, spiritual level. Such 
processes of the human soul or whatever you wish to call it, where the process takes place, because it doesn't take, in the, take place in the organism, but it is a mental or spiritual process, has produced its own adequate form of symbolization that is called autobiography. So wherever there is a consciousness of man in process, the problem of autobiography begins to develop as an interesting subject matter. Otherwise, you would simply have only a stolid type which never changes. But when you become aware of the change and of the importance of change, then autobiographical problems begin to present themselves. Also, uh, already in antiquity, there, that's when autobiography begins. So, we have always a problem that on the one hand there are stable features in man, on the other hand there is a process going on and especially the process of discovering that man has stable features. Because man as a subject matter to be defined in any term at all is not omnipresent in history, but it arises in Greek civilization with specific definitions of man, as for instance the animal rationale, the zoon nun echon in Greek, an animal that has mind or news or reason, and such a definition is in itself an event in the history of mankind. Now one peculiarity of this event, as it happens in Greek philosophy, however, is that the result, a formulation of the nature of man in stable terms, such a definition as man is a rational animal, is resulting from it. But there is not included in this observation that the observation itself is a new event in history. Therefore, you have then a peculiar structure of all classical philosophy of order. You have insights into the personal structure of man as a stable structure in a given situation of the late politics. That is, for instance, the typical content of Aristotelian ethics. The structure of man and the structure of his behavior, proper, uh, true behavior according to his nature in society and the world. Or you can then expand that picture of man as a perfect stable structure into a perfect stable structure of society as it ought to be. That is then the content of the paradigms of the best constitution in Aristotelian politics or in Platonic politics. But there is nowhere in the series of ethics and politics, which are after all the two volumes of a philosophy of order, a third volume, which would have to be called historics, where one would go into the problem that such stable features as described in ethics and politics are discovered at a certain point in history in Plato and Aristotle and why and what went before it was possibly could come after. So the event character itself does not become thematic but only the result. So this reflexive element, which is a process element in the nature of man, that would, if unfolded, contain the problem, or the problem that the nature of man at any given time, so it has stable features, contains always a self-understanding of man at a given historical period in his relations to all other sectors of reality, the world, God, and society. So all these other relations are envisaged in a certain manner in which they were not envisaged before and in a manner in which no longer we do envisage them today. So this element of envisaging the nature of man, understanding himself, developing these images of self-understanding in addition to the results. See? So this picture of a specific humanity, not only the recognition of the structure of man, but of humanity in the sense of being man in a certain manner in relation to all other elements of reality. That is what I would like to call humanity as distinguished from a stable nature of man. So that is what is meant by humanity. Now, that gives the leaders with a number of definitions which I may conclude this section. That is to say, humanity means then 
man in a mode of understanding himself in his relation to God, world and society. And these modes change. And history then would be the drama, if any meaning in it can be discovered, of humanity, of the self-understandings of man. So with that I want to leave all the introductory part and I hope I have done my duties in that respect and now can come to the subject matter of the three lectures. <laughs> But that is already part of the third lecture. Here we have to deal now with first the plan of the lecture. I shall develop only that for the first uh, lecture and uh, ma mention the others. The three, the, the three titles for the three lectures are Man in the Cosmos, The Epiphany of Man, and Man in the Revolt. I shall now give only, again in diagrammatical form, because it sometimes is more persuasive than any other uh, elaborate uh, declaration, the relation of these three topics to one another. If you take on the level of the cosmic experience some nice pudding like that as including all the realities <laughs> such as man, God, heaven, earth, society, and God knows what, <laughs> with an order in it. A sort of uh, ordered community, uh, ordered community of partners in this whole uh, globe of reality. When then, in the flow of reality, there springs up the element of consciousness in man, to the level of self-consciousness, you will get here a sort of smaller glow in it, representing the consciousness of man, in which he is conscious of being in relation to his divine ground of existence. That is the actual constant of consciousness when it appears. Now that would be an event within cosmic reality, the differentiation of consciousness. Now it is possible, of course, to isolate that consciousness against the rest of the cosmic reality in which it has arisen. Then we would have here now a second such globe containing only this part here, with this tangent, in which there is nothing but God is a transcendent pole and man is an immanent pole and all the rest of reality is forgotten. That is a possibility, which actually happens. And then you can go on and forget, for instance, about the trans transcendent pole. Man rarely forgets about himself. <laughs> and uh, then there is nothing left but here a sort of decapitated immanent. <laughs> and that is about the situation of contemporary conception of man. <laughs> so, to take one sector of reality out of the larger reality, isolate it against the whole cosmic reality, call that the reality of philosophy or revelation, and then you cut that in half, decapitate the transcendent part, and to a left then this is the lower part, this is the image. So this first part, the first diagram, would be man and the cosmos. The second part, in isolation, the epiphany of man, the differentiation of the consciousness out of the general reality of the cosmos. And then the breaking in two, the snapping of this standing here to the divine ground, and uh, man in the revolt would be the third topic. So that is, of course, a very rough draft, but um, you will see that it's not too far off the truth. So that is about uh, what I want to say about the organization of the lectures. Now, for the first lecture. It will be about man and the cosmos, and there we have to deal with the primary experience of the cosmos represented by the first night round pudding there. In that reality, the historical sites are the ancient civilizations, especially the civilizations of Egypt, Sumer, and Babylon. Now for terminology, let's be clear about it. The term cosmos, by which we have to refer to this type of experience, I shall explain what it is later, uh, is a late Greek term. It is not a term which appears in the ancient oriental civilizations themselves. 
in these original cosmological civilizations to which I have just referred, there is no comprehensive term for the cosmos. But there we talk only about the realities concretely that we have there. So, for instance, about heaven and earth. So that even when you then get into the prophetic period, the best you can predict is a new heaven and a new earth. Sometimes translated as a new world and a new cosmos. But that is the original cosmological reality. A heaven and an earth. The heaven you can see, the earth you can see. No speculative concept here. Or the gods, man and society. Or within society, a ruler, the king, and the people. So these are the terms in which in the literary text of cosmological civilizations one talks about the reality. A term for the cosmos does not appear. It's only a term for the order of this community of partners in some sort of community for which there is no term except the later Greek term cosmos. Especially I want to uh, draw your attention to the problem that the gods are intracosmic. There is no such thing as a world transcendent god in any cosmological civilization. And very long even then in the revelation and philosophy. There is no world transcendent God. It's a very peculiar problem how that problem arises at all. But in the cosmological civilizations, the gods are intracosmic, part of the cosmos. With that in mind now, let me say a word about the expressive forms, the symbolizations in which such an idea is, uh, such an experience is expressed. It is usually called the myth. And here we are still in a considerable methodological quandary in the practice of science. Because uh, the comparative religionists and mythologists and archaeologists usually subscribe still to the older conceptions of myth which are rooted in the general phenomenology of religion. That is, they are fundamentalist. One takes the phenomenon of a symbol and does not go back to the experience that has produced it. Therefore, if you take the myth as a symbolic as a phenomenon of a symbol, you arrive then at such a definition of the myth as you find, for instance, by in, in Iliad's myth and reality. Let me read that to you, because then you will see easiest what uh, the new problem is. Iliad defines myth. Myth narrates a sacred history, relates an event that took place in primordial time, the fabled time of the beginnings. In other words, myth tells how, through the deeds of supernatural beings, a reality came into existence, be it the whole of reality, the cosmos, or only a fragment of reality an island, a species, a plant, a particular kind of human behavior, an institution. Myth, then, is always an account of a creation. It relates how something was produced, began to be. Now, against this very much accepted definition of myth, I would make the following exemptions. In the first place, when you go strictly empirically at the material, literary documents of a cosmological civilization, the Egyptian, the Sumerian, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, or even the Hindu, no, anything. Only a very small percentage of all the materials are stories of anything. But when you have to deal, for instance, with the tension between a ruler and the gods, or a ruler and the people, or a wisdom invasion, say, of the Hyksos, I've come back to this example in Egypt. No stories of the gods will tell you anything, but there are quite different forms of expression than stories. So the formulation, must then is always an account of creation, is flatly wrong in the face of the empirical facts. There are quite other types of must than that. The second point is that <coughs> The gods are designated as supernatural beings. That is, of course, impermissible. Then, the term supernatural as opposed to natural 
is a scholastic terminology, very commonly used by Thomas Aquinas, and from scholasticism as part of dogma, it has entered into the dogmatism of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, and uh, Eliard is rather an Enlightenment ideologue in this respect and a scholastic. In that connection, we speak of supernatural as opposed to natural. And as has indicated, no man living in a cosmological civilization ever knew that the gods were a supernature as against the nature. But there were heaven and earth and the gods and man and the king. And all was part of this partnership. Nothing in it was more natural than anything else. So the term nature and supernature just makes no sense if it's anachronistically when used with regard to a cosmological civilization. That makes sense in the 13th century of scholasticism, that makes sense in enlightenment under the influence of natural science, but it makes no sense whatsoever when you deal with an ancient civilization. So for that reason, one cannot accept these nominalistic definitions, and you have to take a realistic definition, which is very much simpler. You can then simply say, myth is that body of symbols which had in fact been found adequate by the members of such civilizations for expressing their experiences of the cosmos in which they lived. Nobody can object against that. We simply go back to the empirical facts. <coughs> and now, let me make good that uh, what I said. In the myth you have a lot of things which are not stories. For instance, I have listed here nine different types. Let me just enumerate them. Two of them I shall then deal with with examples. You have symbolizations of the established order of empire. The empire is an analogon of the cosmos. You might call it a small cosmos, a cosmion. Such formulations of the analogy between empire structure and cosmic structure are, for instance, to be found in the famous preamble to the Codex Hammurabi. No story of that. Parallel structure between the heaven and the earth. The parallel, the small cosmos. Then, a case in which you have history, but a history of a peculiar kind, a foundation myth of empire. So the established myth is symbolized by the parallel, the analogy. A foundation myth must be uh, symbolized by an action among the gods. The form is not a history strictly, but a drama, such as the theology of Memphis of probably 3000 BC. So a drama which tells the story of the foundation of Egypt as a drama enacted among the gods of Egypt. Then, in the crisis periods, as for instance the first intermediate period, in the, uh, about 2200 to 2000 was the height of that crisis in Egypt, you find highly intricate discussion of the contemporary skeptical arguments with an existential analysis of true existence leading out of this mess. We'll come back to that. Or, you have Little, uh, um, lyrics expressing skepticism in the gods. So not being a story of the gods at all, but expressing skepticism of man with regard to the stories told about the gods. As for instance, the song of the harp. Song for skeptics. Yes. A vast body is roughly an equivalent to what you would find on the ordinary level of common sense in the 18th century sense. The wisdom literature. Nothing about the gods, only about man, but in the context of a cosmological experience. Then, the great expressions of defeat, victory, restoration of empire. No story at all. The relation between the ruler and God. That is the problem. Then, the ritual the renewals of order in the New Year festival what Iliad usually brings under the eternal return, the eternal return. There is no eternal return in any ancient civilizations. There's only a rhythmical renewal. And the rhythm is not an eternal return. Let me briefly explain it because there's still a lot of misunderstanding about it. When you have a, a rhythmical renewal, you have something like a sinus. <coughs> 
that's the annual spring, summer, fall, and winter, going on and on. But then there is something like a return, a turn of return of the thing, and that would be <coughs> really a certain of events in which, as Aristotle does with the problem, asks the question, if I'm living here at the point in the present, that in my present, and then I have an historical event like the war against Troy, then I can ask myself the question, which way am I nearer to the war against Troy? This way going backward, or this way going forward? That would be eternal return. But such an eternal return in the historical conception is nowhere to be found before the 7th century BC in Hinduism and in Hellas. No ancient civilization had ever any conception of an eternal return, but only the rhythmical renewal. Well, that was not a story either, but the question of ritual renewal. Then, something else which properly does not come under much in the center of the story of the gods at all. That is, the construction of unilinear history from the beginning of the creation of the world down to the present imperial presence, the empire. We have, which is also very little known, unilinear history in ancient civilization. But we have no cyclical history. There's no concept of cyclical time or cyclical history in the ancient civilization of the cosmological time. But there is unilinear history. I shall come back to that in the second place. Uh, and then we have all sorts of symptoms of a um, breakthrough beyond cosmic experience in the direction of either a beginning in time, that would be this dimension here, extrapolation into the past to the point of origin, or to find the origin in transcendence here. So we have speculated from extrapolation of a known part of history, say this part, extrapolating it back to the beginning, in one way or two. Or turns directed without benefit of other parts of reality to an unknown God beyond all the known gods. So the problem of the unknown God is a problem already in Egyptian civilization and the main god of the later period, Amon, the Egyptian word Amon means the hidden one. So the hidden god, which then becomes very virulent, the Gnosticism, is already present in the Amon hymns at the latest in the 8th century BC. So here you have all sorts of literature and symbolic expressions, which are all would lump as myths, and of which only a small part has the character of a story. As you have seen from the enumeration already, also, all human problems and situations with which we are familiar, question of loss of existence, questions of alienation, of crisis, of empire, of personal crisis, and so on, all are subject matter of expression in a peculiar media. So not only just one blocked like peculiar conception of this or that. And I want now to give you one or two examples of uh, what that looks like in times of crisis, but really uh, expression in the medium of cosmological civilization uh, is uh, what it looks like if it is not a story. And I want to give two examples. One example, perhaps I can do that still today, uh, from the point of view of the ruler, and one example from the point of view of the common man. Now, from the point of view of the ruler, there is preserved a very interesting, um, we have no term for that, a declaration of the only female pharaoh, the Queen Hatshepsut, 1501 to 1480 before Christ, on occasion of the restoration of order after the expulsion of the nomad invaders, the Hyksos. Let me read you that information of the queen to the people. 
Hear all ye people and folk, as many as they may be. I have done these things through the counsel of my heart. Cora, now she tells what he thinks. I have not forgetfully slept, but have restored what had been ruined. I have raised up what had gone to peace. When the Asiatics were in the midst of Avaris in the Northland, and among them were nomads, overthrowing what had been made, they ruled without Ray, the Egyptian god, and he, Ray, did not act through divine command down to my majesty. <coughs> that was the crisis. Now comes the result of restoration. I am established on the thrones of rain. I was foretold for the limits of the years and the one who was to come. I am come as the Uriel serpent of horrors, flaming against my enemies. I have made distant those whom the gods abominate, and earth has carried off their footprints. That was the restoration. And now the interpretation. This is the command of the father of my fathers who comes at his appointed times of Ray, the son of God. And there shall not occur damage to what Amon Ray has commanded. My own command endures like the mountains. The sun disk shines forth and spreads rays over the titles of my majesty, and my falcon is high above my name standard for the duration of eternity. Now here you see what a uh, so-called mystical expression is. Here speaks a ruler after the Hyksos have been expelled from the country. And now comes in two, always in pairs, first, the achievement of the queen. She has um, restored what had been ruined. And the characterization of ruin is they ruled, these invaders, the Celtic invaders, without the sun god. So there is rule without proper rule. And God did not act through divine command down to my majesty. That is, the order is mediated through the pharaoh from the gods. And the gods did not let the order flow from himself through the pharaoh down to the empire of the people living in it. So that is the definition of this order. Now when it is re-established, then the pharaoh is again the mediator of divine order to the people, thanks to the God. And then comes, in the second part, again opposed to one another, this is the command of the father, and my own command endures like the mountains. Always the parallel between the king and the, the, the God and the king and the order. The time for order, by the way, Ma'at. So that goes all through the gods. The Ma'at is dispensed from the gods down uh, through the pharaoh to the empires, administrators, and the people. So when the cause is interrupted, then there is this order. So you may call it a story, I don't know if you think it is a story, but it is a description of the dynamics of order in terms of the relation between the gods, the king, the people, and the invaders. So here is trouble. Now in this kind of trouble, you then have also the commoners bitterly suffering. All of that. <laughs> Can you stick it out another quarter of hour? In the famous dispute of a man who wants to commit suicide with his soul. So that is not a pharaoh, but a commoner. He wants to commit suicide if there is his order, because he doesn't like to live in that sort of uh, environment. <coughs> and from this I want just to uh, give a few examples of this description. I cannot give the whole analysis, but because time is too far advanced, but at least a few examples. He describes the disordered social world in which he lives. Now look at the formulation. They are always given in testics in which the first line is repeated. He says, for instance, to whom can I speak today? 
one's fellows are evil. The friends of today do not love. If you translate it into classical philosophy or Christian terminology, it means that the classical filia politica, or the love among men in confidence, has disappeared when the order emanating from the gods is gone. Everything has become a man alone for himself and has become evil, therefore. Very drastically, this loneliness and the loss of character is uh, described in the following Christian. To whom can I speak today? Faces have disappeared. Every man has a downcast face towards his fellows. Like a modern urbanized society, <laughs> you might say, Riesmann's lonely crowd or such parallels emerge immediately. Or, to whom can I speak today? There is no one contented of heart. The man with whom one went no longer exists. So the dissolution of society, destruction, disappearance of contentment, the phenomenon of alienation making itself still. That is a description of the society when there is this order. And then, how is that to be interpreted? When there is such disorder, man turns away from a life that has become sent and contemplate suicide. Let me give you at least two of these suicide lists. Death faces me today, like the recovery of a sick man, like going out into the open after a confinement. Death faces me today, like the longing of a man to see his home again, after many years that he was held in captivity. And so he goes on and on, all the metaphors of escape from this reality as a release from sickness, a release from prison, a release from a darkness that makes you see the light and the so And turning, uh, returning to a sort of home now. And then what should be the result of such escape from this senseless reality? A sort of judgment in the beyond. In the last body, uh, last group of these statistics, he says, Why surely he who is yonder will be a living God, punishing the sin of him who commits it? Why surely he who is yonder will stand at the back of the sun, causing the choices therein to be given to the temples? Why surely he who is yonder will be a man of wisdom, not hindered from appealing to Ray when he speaks? A sort of conception of a judgment in the beyond, in which man can participate because he is immortal when he commits suicide in order to escape a world in which he is completely alienated, which has become strange to him, and against which death is then the real life. Very similar to the formulation which you find in Plato's Guardians, for instance. Now, here you have an almost complete analysis of a deficient existence in society when the ma'at, the order, has disappeared. Of a recovery of a truth of existence in the sense of the divine order which is necessary. But in this particular situation, a despair that through any sort of social action it could be achieved, and that therefore the only sense, a meaningful uh, cause of action would be suicide that would bring man in his immortality into the company of the sun god and there reinforce his ordering power again for the world for the restoration of the empire of Egypt. Now that is under Egyptian conditions of course a revolutionary conception because under the empire conception only the pharaoh is the mediator of divine order. A single Egyptian can do nothing about it, he can only create this order. When here now appears a single man who bangs way of suicide becomes a living god like the pharaoh in the bark of the sun god. He places himself in the place of the pharaoh. So the center of order is understood to be man, not the ruler, the ultimate center of order. And this existential insight that the order is man, and not in the social organization only the pharaoh, is absolutely present here. But it cannot crystallize into or under other conditions it might become 
a revolutionary move, or a prophet who could assemble a sect around himself, or a philosopher who could found an academy or anything like that. Because all that is under Egyptian conditions yet impossible. The empire, in the cosmological sense, is so strongly institutionalized that if you have not status on the administrative level, on the priestly level of the temples and so on, you are nobody with regard to the order of the empire among the living. You would have to join the dead in the bark of the sun god in order to count for something. And that is why suicide becomes a problem. If that is no longer, uh, if uh, um, the empire institutions are no longer so strongly alive that they are an absolute block to individual activity, then only you get into the problem of revolutionary action through new intellectual or other spiritual movements with the center of a personality prophet or something like that. So that is not yet possible. So let me close there with, and the next time we come then to the epiphany of man, when just such things become possible, how that can be done. Thank you very much.